Thanks for joining me on this DCO session at the last minute. I know it seems like short notice, but I think you'll really benefit from this information on the early side as you begin thinking about putting your requirements together and assembling a strategy for your acquisition. Once it is determined who your contracting officer will be and your team is identified, I will get you scheduled for the integrated source selection training. But in the meantime, this overview I'm providing here today will give you a good basis of understanding as to what to consider as you begin making your plan. I see that our program manager Michael has joined in. And oh, it looks like our SSEB chair, Major Torres, has just joined too. Now we're just waiting for our legal advisor, Carol. I know she'll be along shortly, so I'm going to just go ahead and proceed. I'm just going to sort of skip over this cover slide and move on now that we have everyone together here. And oh look, I see Carol is on our session now. Perfect. Good morning, Carol. Thanks for being part of this DCO. I know you are someone who really appreciates when teams lean forward like this one is doing. I absolutely do appreciate it. Too often we see issues in source selection that really stem from a lack of effective, comprehensive planning and buy-in across the acquisition team. This kind of early engagement can go a long way towards alleviating those concerns. Okay, we're on slide two now. I think this slide is a good summation of what we are trying to achieve. Our ACC mission is to deliver contracting solutions, and to do that, what do we do? Plan the work and work the plan. We do all of this to successfully realize the ACC vision. To be recognized by our supported commands and stakeholders as strategic partner and mission enabler by maintaining the highest standards in service, reliability, and operational excellence. The big takeaway here is that in order to achieve success, we must pay attention to these details early in the process. By establishing the team and resources to execute the acquisition, we are creating true partnerships and creating the right environment to identify and resolve issues to stay on track throughout the process. By doing this, we are not only taking care of the customer and the mission, but are going to avoid a lot of other complications down the road that are very predictable when we're late in starting in earnest. I have a quick question. Okay, shoot. How can we actually pinpoint when we need to start work on our acquisition? This is a nagging issue for program offices because we already have so much work for the current fiscal year and resources are a challenge. That's a great question and we'll take a look at that very thing on the next slide. I like this slide because it really says a lot and speaks to your question at the same time. You'll see that you are advised to start planning as soon as the need is identified. If your requirement is truly new and there is no existing contract, you must begin this planning process as soon as the requirement is identified. There are many factors that will influence the time that you will need to account for in the milestone schedule including stability and complexity of the requirements, as well as the amount of competition expected. A big-time driver is also the dollar value, which will trigger various review and approval thresholds along the way. We can generally estimate the length of time you should allow based upon these and other factors based on our experience and average pulp for similar acquisitions. You always need to keep in mind the funding type you have and the expiration of those funds. If this is a recompete of an existing contract, you will need to back the time out from the expiration date of that contract so there won't be a risk for a break in service or any need to put in place a bridge contract for interim coverage. There can be some real scrutiny on bridge contracts, as well as justification and approvals, and for good reason, we are expected to plan. This is something the team will do together in order to get on the same page and establish the right expectations. That makes sense. It's a lot to take in. And we're just getting started. Okay, let's move on to the next slide, which is essentially a look at the team makeup. Identifying and assembling the team early makes all the difference. The participation level of each team member will vary throughout the process, but certain key members of the team will be highly involved from the beginning to end. Key members of the team include you folks, program manager or acquiring activity, contract officer or contracting specialist, source selection authority or SSA, Source Selection Evaluation Board, or SSEB Chair, Cost Price, Legal Advisor, Small Business Advisor, some key team members are dictated by the requirements. You know, I see that I'm included as a key member as the SSEB Chair, and I'm actually relieved. The last time I did this, I was brought into the process very late, and it just didn't work out very well. There were so many decisions I wasn't included in, and I would have changed or revised against if I had been included. I and my whole evaluation team had to just live with it. It wasn't easy. I can certainly understand that. The importance of identifying the key team members very early in the planning just cannot be overstated. I couldn't agree more. 
A lot of time can be lost when people are brought in late, and it is time we just cannot afford to lose. The knowledge and understanding of the SSEB chair, based not only on technical aspects of the requirements, but also the experience of how the SSEB process works, and maybe what doesn't work, including how to manage the schedule and the evaluation teams, how and when to assemble reports and briefings, all of that understanding is absolutely essential. The SSEB chair is essentially the quarterback for the evaluation. Let's look at slide five now. It's really just a snapshot of the main phases of acquisition planning at the summary level. Think of this process in three buckets or parts. One, acquisition planning process. This encompasses all of the upfront work the team will do to support the acquisition strategy. From assembling the team to the various activities taken to ensure the performance work statement reflects our requirements accurately, the market research techniques we use to understand the capabilities of industry, and where we can improve based on input from internal and external stakeholders. All of it. Two, acquisition strategy and best value approach. After the upfront investment to ensure the requirements are updated and the market is understood, you will now have the information you need to begin work on the acquisition strategy and the request for proposal or RFP from sections A through K. 3. Develop the RFP and source selection plan. In this phase, the team is ready and able to finalize sections L and M of the RFP for integration to source selection plan. While this is the most tedious part, all of the efforts in the first two phases really provide the right basis to establish what and how to evaluate proposals to achieve best value. It's a logical approach in which each phase sets the foundation to develop the next phase. When done as a team, this process will result in a well-thought-out acquisition strategy and plan that will lead to the ability to discriminate between offerers' proposals and the critical areas of risk, and accurate information enabling the SSA to select the best value offerer or offerers and justify any trade-offs as the basis for selection. And that's what we're really getting at here, the roadmap, to get to a best value decision in the end. This slide just provides some good resources and guidance references for the requirements generation process. We now spend over 50% of all acquisition dollars on service contracts. It's important that we get what we pay for. Performance-based strategies focus on desired outcomes. The seven-step service acquisition process is explained in detail on the Defense Acquisition University, or DAU, Service Acquisition Mall website. DOD Directive 5000.1 states to use performance-based strategies and contractual language to maximize competition, innovation, and interoperability, enable flexibility, reduce cost, improve lifecycle support, task contractor in clear and concise language. Sometimes it's tough to resist the how-tos in the PWS, but I know that when we are including a lot of how-tos, it really isn't a performance-based work statement any longer. We have to get away from doing that, especially since we want the contractor to tell us their approach. Industry probably knows a lot more than we do about the requirements in certain important aspects anyway, so we should be prescriptive only when it's absolutely necessary. Very true. And that's what we want to elicit from them in their proposal, their approach. That leads us right into slide seven, which is really straightforward in describing the various types of formats used to set forth the requirements. Since you'll be working with the PWS for services, you can see that the document will describe the required results in clear, specific, and objective terms with measurable outcomes. The next slide really calls out the PWS and other documents that work together to describe the requirements and reports needed based on the contract data requirements lists and so forth. These documents will complete the picture to express what the government needs the contractor to do and to provide. I love this one, folks. Slide 9 illustrates a major consideration when putting together the requirements. Affordability. It's so very important to consider the impact of technology, innovation, the cost of this, and whether it will provide a benefit the government is willing to pay for. Each acquisition is different and has unique characteristics which deserve fresh consideration, even if there have been many preceding contracts for the same requirements. Conditions change, which can drive decision-making. Budget constraints are a primary consideration. Many programmatic influences come into play, all of which are taken into account to determine the best way ahead. Importantly, market research will help to fill in the gaps to understand more about this in order to make informed decisions. Now we're on slide 10, and that brings us to market research. 
market research is a really important process that too often is overlooked or given lip service, and that is unfortunate because we can learn so much from it. The results of market research drives many of the major decisions that are made regarding the acquisition strategy and directly help to shape it. There are some things we always do, like issuing a sources sought notice, and we are able to gauge interest in the requirements based upon responses received. Consider issuing a draft RFP. Oftentimes there is a mindset where we cannot afford the time to issue a draft RFP, but consider the advantages. Draft RFPs may consist only of Section B, CLINs, and C, Draft PWS, but by releasing it, as it currently stands, and inviting comments and questions from industry, it can provide a mechanism to identify and resolve concerns and possibly revise or clarify the PWS, etc. This may avoid extensions to the solicitation once it is released and increase the quality of proposals received. You may or may not have a draft section L and M at that point, but the main objective is getting the requirements right and understanding the market. So we don't actually need to have a full-up RFP to release as a draft? No, you really don't. The most important thing is to get the draft requirements out to industry so all sides can test their validity and learn how they might be improved. This is so great to know. We could go ahead and review that, and probably the attachments, and get it out to industry pretty quickly. Industry days are another good method of conducting market research and generating interest in the requirement, especially on the part of small business. This event may also provide opportunities for matchmaking with small business as partners or to identify contractors for teaming arrangements. Remember, industry days are different than pre-proposal conferences, where each section of the complete RFP is explained as well as expectations for responses by industry. So you can see from slide 11, market research really is like a research project. One of the biggest mistakes we see organizations make is cutting the previous PWS and sections L and M and pasting them into the next RFP. While it may seem like this practice is a time saver, in reality it's a disservice to both government and industry in most cases. We take the information we learn during the market research process and apply other techniques to improve and validate the requirements, like the SWOT analysis, which we'll discuss, and the Service Acquisition Workshop, better known as the SAW. I see that a lessons learned report is mentioned too. I wonder if there is one in the files somewhere. Definitely I have to check that out. I'm curious. Michael. If we don't find one for the previous acquisition, I'm going to make sure we have a lessons learned report for this one. No one goes back to their duties till it's done. I just have to say that is music to my ears. We simply must do a better job of finishing the work when we do source selections, and writing this report is a part of that. Great discussion. As we move along to slide 12, we are really emphasizing industry engagement as part of the market research. This is why it is so important to allow adequate time on the front end of the acquisition planning process because the sources and methods for executing good market research are many and extremely beneficial. Traditional methods like industry days are good, but those will only get us so far because contractors tend not to open up too much in a setting like that. In other words, they receive information but do not necessarily share information. Contractors tend to share their insights much more during one-on-one exchanges. And let's face it, that's where a lot of expertise lies. While we do need to be careful when conducting one-on-ones in terms of not sharing information not currently being made available to industry as a whole, at the same time, it provides a great opportunity to receive valuable feedback on the requirements. The program manager, or PM, should conduct one-on-ones with the contracting officer in all ground rules for the process set and understood in advance. This pretty slide sums it up. It's all about improving outcomes and reaping benefits as a result of your due diligence in the process of market research. It really is a central influencer of the acquisition strategy, from determining commerciality to determining small business capabilities to understanding how other agencies obtain the same or similar services and establishing potential evaluation criteria. And you'll see that as you begin to move your acquisition strategy and supporting documents through the review and approval process, the work you have put into this process will pay off. You will be able to support and defend your conclusions as you receive questions and challenges which also saves time and rework. When you look at this slide, the SWOT analysis is just a visual way to make sense of something you may have already started doing. You want to canvas the internal and external stakeholders and find out what's going well and what could be going better. The objective is to look at areas which create or contribute to risk and make course corrections in the requirements for your current acquisition. Ask what is causing delays, misunderstandings. Are we asking for reports that are unnecessary, but we pay for anyway? 
are there any non-value-added requirements? What adds cost and or time but not value? What absorbs your already scarce resources and causes unnecessary oversight requirements? Oh, I can think of a few things right off the top of my head. And once I start talking to people, I'm sure I'll uncover more. This really makes sense to do. It really is just common sense. The next few slides focus on assessing risk. This step is where we bring it all together as we look at the revised PWS based on our market research, SWOT analysis, and SAW. The investment made in doing those things will really help to focus in on the high-risk areas. Those are the areas that should become evaluation criteria. Remember, we do not have the time or resources to evaluate everything, and the good news is we don't need to. This slide highlights sample areas to be assessed for risk. As part of the acquisition strategy, you must perform some form of risk assessment for all competitive acquisitions to identify and track risk drivers, determine discriminators for source selections, identify contract type, refine requirements, identify contract incentive focus areas if they exist. The high risk areas that become discriminators, evaluation criteria, will enable the SSEB to evaluate the offerers on what matters the most to successful accomplishment of the work and supporting your program. Some risk is inherent. Not all risks are equal. Any negative findings, weaknesses, significant weaknesses, and deficiencies will be the subject of discussions for those offerers who are in the competitive range, and they will be afforded the opportunity to address or resolve them in their proposal revision. I always advise the contracting officer to provide the offerers their positive findings, strengths, as well. Understanding what is right with the proposal helps provide context to understand what might be wrong with it. That is what we want because those findings enable the Source Selection Advisory Council, SSAC, to identify the remaining findings after discussions and final proposal revisions in these areas that show the differences between proposals and conduct a comparative analysis which enables the SSA to select the offeror whose proposal represents the best value to the government. So when the SSEB conducts the evaluation, they would be looking not only the offeror's approach, but also how they propose to mitigate risks for that area, correct? I was thinking that same thing, and I believe you're correct. But what do you say, Beverly? You will want to write the evaluation factor in such a way that it also elicits the information where it is important to the evaluation. The mitigation may be inherent in the proposal for that area, but you could call it out specifically as well. This slide illustrates the process of risk planning management. By actively and continuously examining the program for risks, it helps to frame the areas of risk, assign resources, and use this information to develop the best acquisition strategy. Risk management is a continuous and iterative effort that becomes a primary tool for decision-making and ultimately program success. It helps to focus limited resources on critical elements of the program, or providing a good management vehicle to balance, manage, and control your performance, schedule, and cost. Risk management also works to minimize negative consequences to the program. As a PM, I'm always thinking about risk, and I can see how that thinking can be applied to proactively help to manage risk as an inherent part of our contracts. When I see it outlined this way, it makes it easier to understand how it's possible to really focus the source selection process on the matters that concern us the most. That's so true. Too often evaluations encompasses far too much, and most of it the contractor must do anyway by virtue of the PWS requirements and the terms and conditions of the contract. We don't need to know how the offerer will do everything, just the most important things. I've seen it muddy up the evaluation, and it just takes so long, especially if we receive a number of proposals. It becomes hard to keep momentum across the SSEB under those circumstances. And we always have quite a time staffing the boards to begin with. I hear you, Michael. And that's why it's so important to really hone in on the important areas discerned between the offerers and to be smart as to how you structure the evaluation. We'll talk more about that here in a few minutes. These slides are just two different ways of displaying how the process works together to take you from requirements generation through selection of the evaluation criteria and development of sections L and M. You can clearly see how all of these pieces fit together. A common thread throughout this presentation is how important it is to work as a team and invest the time up front to set the acquisition up for success. 
I would just like to take a moment right now to say how critical it is for the program management requirements owner and the procuring contracting officer become best friends very early in the process. And the Source Selection Support Centers of Excellence, SCOEs, are a resource to provide training to the entire team as well as advisory assistance from beginning to end. We can't afford to bounce the package back and forth. We lose too much time that we do not have. So we must work as a team from the beginning to be successful. So when it comes to selecting evaluation factors and sub-factors, the Army FAR supplement, AFARS, says less is more. And we do not assign numerical weighting points or percentages ever. Always remember that we determine what we will evaluate first. Section M, evaluation factors for award, and that will inform Section L, instructions to offerers, to determine what the offerers will need to provide in the proposal response to satisfy the evaluation. Section M is linked to Section C, the performance work statement, and the work to be performed that represents key risk areas. Section M is the most important section to source selection and the most difficult to develop. But when you've done your due diligence up front, as we've been discussing today, it makes this part so much easier. Here are some great points and takeaways to think about as you determine what to evaluate. Limit the number of factors and sub-factors. Meaningfully link them to key risk areas. Enable an accessible variance. This would ultimately allow for a comparative analysis of that factor to allow the Source Selection Authority, or SSA, to make a best value trade-off based upon whether or not the value is worth a price premium or not. Entry gate criteria. This one is a biggie. Are there requirements that are purely objective, would enable a pass-fail or go-no-go assessment to be met up front and for purposes of elimination of unqualified offerers? This combination approach can streamline the evaluation and reduce the number of full evaluations the SSEB will conduct but the entry gate criteria must be requirements that the offerer has to meet up front to demonstrate they are qualified to proceed in the evaluation. Examples of entry gate criteria are required experience in maintaining a particular aircraft and requisite corporate certifications such as JCO certification to provide hospital aseptic services. I would really like to look into whether or not there are valid requirements we could use as entry gate criteria. That approach will really help us streamline the evaluation and know that we are only investing time to evaluate offers who demonstrate they are truly qualified. I like that idea as well. And I wonder if prospective offerers would just decline to propose knowing they can't meet those criteria. I mean, if it were me, I wouldn't invest the time on a requirement like that. I believe that is very realistic. It is a valid practice to do this so long as we explain it clearly in the RFP and the entry gate criteria are purely objective. Section L must track to Section M, striking the right balance of asking for what is needed to evaluate against the criteria is paramount. We want enough information to conduct a fair and thorough evaluation, but not too much information as to become burdensome or cause confusion. The instructions for proposal structure and submission are really straightforward, but it's very important to get this part right. To receive good proposals that are organized and with the content needed, we must ask for what we want and clearly explain how we want it. This slide is just an illustration of the key RFP sections and their relationships to form an effective evaluation. But what I want to leave you with is the understanding that this complex process is a team effort. When the team forms early and works well together, the chances for a successful, timely source selection go way up. These are just a few best practices to keep in mind, but they are time-tested and always apply. I would also encourage you to record and share best practices as you discover them as you move through your acquisition process because we can all benefit from them. As we wrap up the session, what I want you to know and remember is that you have people and resources. The ACC has prioritized the stand-up of SCOEs at all of the centers, ACC Orlando and the MIC. Take advantage of your people, their expertise and advice as you begin planning your acquisition. To find out who your SCOE advisors are, just click on the Source Selection Community of Practice SharePoint page link, then find the SCOE Member tab. The Source Selection Community of Practice SharePoint page provides great resources, including the Source Selection University, where you'll find other videos on the Source Selection process and much more, including best practices in the tip vault under Tip of the Day, articles under Good to Know, Chief Counselor Corner, and Protest Watch, to name a few. 
Additionally, the Map app is a go-to resource with end-to-end process flow mapping and current guidance and templates on the entire acquisition lifecycle. So while there is much to know and understand, there's also a lot of help ready and available for you. Please go check it out. That concludes our training today on teaming up early. If any of you have any questions at any time, feel free to let me know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.